My, my, la my last book was A History of Rockefeller Center, which I did in the, in the early part of the, the, the past decade. And the land that Rockefeller Center is built on was, during the 20s, the heart of the speakeasy belt in New York, between 48th and 51st Street, between 5th Avenue and 6th Avenue. There were 228 brownstones, and they were largely speakeasies, flop houses, whorehouses. It was really a, a lousy neighborhood. And the Rockefeller interests, to assemble the land, they needed to acquire the ground leases for each of these buildings. And so I did a lot of research in the city records and found the Rockefellers coming up against uh, speakeasy owners who had more political clout than they did. I said, how did this happen? Which is the best way to begin a, a book. So I, uh, that got me going. And then I found myself just in wandering in this wonderland of this impossibly to, impossible to imagine period when in the Constitution, not just by law, but in the Constitution, uh, it said Americans couldn't get liquor, couldn't get alcoholic beverages. And, you know, there were only two things in the Constitution that, uh, pr that limit the rights of individuals rather than the rights of government or the powers of government. The two things were in the 13th Amendment, you can't own slaves, and in the 18th Amendment, you can't get liquor. Uh, pretty bizarre. So that set me going. I think it relates to where we are today because of the notion of a divided country. And what prohibition was really a stand-in issue. There were people who cared a great deal about prohibition, and they had reason uh, to want liquor to be cut back because the, uh, the rampant drunkenness of the 19th century combined with the fact that women had very few legal rights did lead to a lot of women particularly and children uh, being horribly damaged by the drunkenness that uh, uh, captured so many of their husbands, uh, led to bankruptcies, bringing home disease, uh, um, ruined marriages. In 1830, the, the uh, average adult consumption of liquor was, is, of alcohol is triple what it is today. So imagine uh, the, the society we live in now where the, the booze seems to be flowing pretty freely and then multiply that by three. And you know, even um, that, and that was you know, on a per capita basis. So there were people who abstained. So those who were drinking really drank a great deal. And uh, particularly in rural areas and then as the immigrant populations came in in the cities as well. Um, what it was, other than the concern about drinking, was a, as I said, a battle over the control of the country. Uh, the prohibition was largely, though not exclusively, a movement that came from the middle of the country, native-born white Protestants, uh, who feared losing their country to the Irish, the Italians, the Jews, the Eastern Europeans who were coming into the cities. It was a really intense divide in which the stand-in issue could represent everything else. And I think we're going through exactly the same thing now. I mean, there's no question that there are people who really don't like Obama's health care, but they really don't like the people who support Obama's health care. And, uh, you know, last year the dividing issue could have been gay marriage. The, few years before that, or constantly, it's also abortion. There's stand-in issues that represent a wide, wide range of issues, and that was the division that we had in this country that led to prohibition. This extraordinary thing about prohibition, though there was a real issue about alcohol consumption, there were three other issues that made prohibition happen. Um, the women's suffrage movement, the income tax movement and World War I. Now, what do these things have to do with alcohol? Well, this is the peculiarity of the theater of politics, that things do not seem to be what they are. So the women's suffrage movement had a lot to do with the fact that women had no marital rights. They didn't have rights to divorce. They didn't have property rights. They needed to be able to express themselves for their own self-protection. And they recognized that they had kindred spirits in the prohibitionists. So it was really, we'll support you if you'll support us. And the Women's Christian Temperance Union was the engine, the first engine that really got the prohibition movement going. Then it was realized by the people in the prohibition movement, we can't get rid of alcohol without something to replace it as a revenue producer because as much as 40% of federal revenue came from the excise tax on liquor, going back to the Whiskey Rebellion of the 1790s. So you couldn't suddenly say no liquor, no wine, no beer. You wouldn't be able to run a government any longer. So they made common cause then with the populace who wanted an income tax. And they passed the Income Tax Amendment, the 16th Amendment, in 1913. And only then did it become even possible to seriously consider the possibility of prohibition. And then World War I, what does World War I have to do with prohibition? Well, while after Congress had enacted the amendment and it had to be ratified by three quarters of the states, during that period, World War I begins. All the brewers have German names. Their names are Anheuser, Busch, Pabst, Schlitz, Rupert, Schaefer, 
and on and on and on. And it, it made it possible for the prohibition forces to demonize the brewers as serving the interests of the Kaiser when we were at war with Germany. And that's what put it over the top. So you get these three things that have nothing to do with each other and really nothing to do with the issue at its center, namely prohibition, making it possible for there to be not just a law, but a change in the damn constitution. Um, well, there was probably an increase in crime. You could argue that there was for a period of net positive. L drinking did go down, and it remained down. The, the uh, level of alcohol consumption in the U.S. did not come back to pre-prohibition levels until the 1970s. And in fact, we're a little bit lower than, than the 1970s now. So if you think that there's too much drinking, it did have a positive effect in that sense. Uh, Criminal behavior on a large scale, of course, was rampant every time somebody acquired a drink. Every time you bought a drink or you moved liquor from one place to another, you were breaking the law. Uh, it is also true that the criminal syndicates, the, the national criminal syndicate was entirely a product of prohibition. Until then, the, uh, uh, in each city, you might have a criminal element, a criminal gang that controlled vice of all sorts, prostitution, gambling, drugs. Um, but there was no reason for them to stretch beyond the limits of their own neighborhoods, as it were, or, the, or their cities. Once you had to move great quantities of alcohol from one place to another, you needed cooperation. So the mobs in various cities got together. There was the famous uh, conference in Atlantic City in 1929, the sort of uh, peace conference, in which they divided up the country. And it was one syndicate that agreed not to poach on each other's territory. Without prohibition, there's no reason to do that. So yeah, a lot of increase in crime. On the other hand, the image that we have of the 20s is this area of lawlessness and machine guns, or it was known as the Chicago typewriter, right, that, 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 the submachine gun. Um, the people, uh, there were exceptions, obviously, but it was, ga it was criminal on criminal warfare. Uh, there were not a lot of innocent bystanders uh, who were hurt by that kind of violence. What's comparable, what's interesting to me about the, comp the comparison to the drug trade today is there is a human appetite that drugs is, are satisfying. There's a human appetite that liquor satisfied. And it appears to be the case, I think it's indisputable, that people are going to get their drugs or their liquor whether or not it's against the law. The consequence of the limitation on it, of the legal limitation on it, is that the federal government, the government gets no tax revenue from it. Uh, and it's unable to regulate it effectively. So peculiarly, it was easier to get a drink during Prohibition when it was against the law than it was after Prohibition when it was legal. During Prohibition, there was no regulatory system of any kind. It was simply against the law. After Prohibition, you had age limits. You had to be 18 or 21. You couldn't be open on, uh, liquor stores couldn't be open on Sundays. You couldn't be near a church. There were closing hours. There was an entire superstructure of laws that made it possible to control drinking and to bring in a great deal of revenue. Franklin Roosevelt, in October of 1932, he gave a speech in Newark in which he said, if we brought back beer alone, that would be a quarter of a billion dollars into the U.S. Treasury in one year. And it was. So the notion that we are right now seeing a similar illegal substance that is nonetheless desired uh, being traded in huge quantities by criminal syndicates, um, the notion that that could be something that's regulated, made safer, and provide revenue for the government makes it a very appeal appealing argument for legalization. Mm -hmm.